Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on uh, PGRFSI capabilities and crisis management in food safety. My name is Amy Wayne, and I'm a part of the PGRFSI marketing team. I'll be facilitating today's webinar and providing support for our presenters as needed. Uh, before we get started, I just want to clarify to everyone that all participants are on mute just to ensure call clarity. Um, however, we, we do really want to take your questions. So to take your questions, if you'll look at your GoToWebinar control panel on the side of your screen, there should be a questions tab or question and answer tab. If you expand that, you'll be able to type any questions you might have. And once you send them, they'll pop up on our screens and we will address them all at the end of the broadcast. So just to kick us off, uh, we'd like to take a little poll of our audience here. So our question, First off will be, is your organization currently certified to a GFSI standard? And your options are, yes, we are certified with PGRFSI. Yes, we are certified with another CB. Not yet, looking to become certified within the next six months, or not interested in becoming certified. So I'll just leave this open for a few more seconds. And as the answers come in, All right, we're now showing about 60% participation in this poll, so I'm going to go ahead and close answers. Thank you to everyone who participated. And now I'm going to share the results of the poll on the screen. So it looks like a lot of people are certified either with us here at PGRFSI or with another CB. But there are some of you who are looking to become certified soon. And I know while circumstances might be difficult right now, it really is important to start planning ahead. So without any further ado, I do want to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. It's PGRFSI's own Paul DeMarin. He's our Senior Vice President of Food Safety and Supply Chain. Paul joined PGRFSI in January of this year. He has over 35 years of experience in the hospitality, service, and retail agri-food sectors. Before he joined us at PGRFSI, Paul worked for 15 years in the food and certification industry, working with clients for their food safety, supply chain, brand protection, quality, environmental, health and safety, automotive, aerospace, medical, and information technology requirements. Before he came to work in the certification industry, Paul was a professional chef and a consultant for over 20 years working in major hotel chains, restaurants, private golf courses, and food service organization. So now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Paul. Paul, go ahead and take it away. That's great. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, just to uh, clarify, I'm still seeing the poll um, up on your screen. Is that supposed to be like that? I'm going to go ahead and hide that now. Okay. There we go. Okay, good. All right. So, yeah, let's just go to the next slide there, Amy. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, their time and joining us uh, at the webinar here. We really appreciate your time today. We know how uh, crazy things are right now, and uh, we absolutely appreciate it. Uh, before we begin, um, I, I just want to say a few things that during this terrible pandemic we're all facing at uh, PJR FSI, we're fully committed to the health and well-being of our staff, our customers, and our communities. Uh, we've seen the effects of COVID-19 in Canada, the USA, and really across the world. Uh, but at this time, we've also seen the best in each other between our staff, our clients, and our colleagues. Uh, we see it every day in, in doctors, nurses, first responders who are on the front lines, uh, really out there helping people uh, who are directly affected by the situation. So on behalf of PJRFSI, we applaud all of you and thank you for doing your part uh, during this unprecedented time that we're all going through. And that includes everyone on the call today. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, as Amy mentioned, uh, my name's Paul, I'm the SVP at Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety Inc. or PJRFSI. Uh, for um, simplification, I'll refer to us today as FSI, just to make it a little quicker. Uh, I'm gonna be giving you an overview of our company, who we are, uh, why we believe we're different, what our global capabilities are, and some of the services that we would offer to you. 
I also have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Grant and Reiko Platisa from PCR Corporation, who are subject matter experts in the industry, uh, are very well known. I've known them for many years. And they're also approved global training providers who have received uh, multiple awards over the years through various scheme owners, such as SQF and BRC. So I'd like to just thank uh, Grant and Reiko in advance. Um, so now I want to move on to um, and jump right in. Perry Johnson Registrars, or PJR, was originally founded by Perry L. Johnson in 94. Uh, today, we're the largest registrar in the Americas and have been at the forefront of international certification and the registration industry from the very beginning. Um, after achieving ANAB certification shortly thereafter, PJR's creation in 95, um, our first venture into international business came in 99 uh, through the expansion of our Japanese and Brazilian markets. Uh, the early 2000s would see further growth with us overseas uh, with offices that we opened in Germany, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Canada, Latin America, and Thailand. Uh, during this time, PJR also attained, uh, attained their UCAS accreditation and in more recent years has been broadening its international horizons with offices in the United Kingdom and China. In 2005, TG&A was founded, which is a healthcare technology company that specializes in uh, transcription, medical coding, telemedicine, and virtual uh, scribing services. Scribing services. Um, shortly thereafter, FSI was born as a result of the demand in the industry for third-party certification to many food safety and quality standards. Uh, we're headquartered in Troy, Michigan. You can just go to the next slide there, Amy. Um, we're truly a, a, a global company. Um, you know, we're part of a family of companies that it's in the registration and certification areas. We have global offices around the world, um, and we offer a wide range of food safety certification types from uh, HACCP to GFSI to organic and gluten-free. Recently, we've also added the cannabis safety audits and our program is in the process of becoming um, accredited by the American National Standard Institute or ANSI ANAP. So at this point, I'd like to give uh, just a few highlights of FSI. Uh, first and foremost, we're committed to providing value added uh, food safety certification to our clients and their supply chain. Our entire team believes that um, rigor and consistency during the audit activities leads to higher levels of uh, customer and end user satisfaction. As I mentioned, we're the largest registrar in the Americas. We operate globally, but we think locally and regionally. Uh, we strongly believe that there is a big difference between uh, customer service and customer focus, and we're dedicated to uphold the highest standards of professionalism, technical competence, and integrity throughout the entire uh, audit process for you. Now, as Perry Johnson himself did over 30 years ago, we apply the same principles of quality management, collaboration, uh, organizational excellence in all of our operation and field activities and comply with the requirements that are set forth by international standards organizations, uh, accreditation bodies, and other concerned groups. Through this dedication, we've created and maintained a work environment which uh, provides opportunities and a culture of uh, continual improvement, learning and development for clients, auditors, staff, and stakeholders that are within the food chain. Uh, we currently have over 460 auditors in 60 countries who understand not only the regulations of those countries, uh, but the language and equally important, the culture. Uh, I'm also happy to report that in the last five years, we've received a rating from our clients of nine and a half out of 10, which uh, everyone here is quite proud of. So over the last eight years, uh, FSI has supported and worked with companies in virtually every sector in the industry. As we know, uh, a food supply chain or food system refers to the processes that describe how food from a farm ends up on our tables. Uh, the process included uh, and includes production, processing, distribution, uh, consumption, and even disposal. Uh, today, we work with retailers, processors, farms, importers, distribution companies, and exporters to help them manage not only their food safety, uh, but their supply chain and the quality and brand protection requirements that they have. Uh, our work with food supply chain is growing and constantly developing and now spans across local, regional, national, and international areas. 
and we've progressed from really a series of shorter independent assessments to more collaborative relationships between our producers, processors, uh, manufacturers, and retailers. So at FSI, we understand the importance of food safety and quality certification. As the slide points out at the top, the certification industry has been deemed as an essential service. But why? Because really food safety certification is based on the results of tests, inspections, and audits, and gives confidence to the consumer because an organization's products and or their system are being thoroughly evaluated against accepted national and international industry standards by a competent third party. Now, this doesn't mean today that it's business as usual, far from it actually. Uh, there are several required changes to how our businesses will run, and I'm sure yours during this time, and we need to ensure we continue to provide high quality service while maintaining safety and doing our part to reduce the impacts of COVID-19. As a company, we're not taking this lightly. Uh, we have many webinars planned in April that are speaking also specifically about this, but currently we've used every recommended precaution in our business today. Our goal is to uh, reduce and or eliminate direct physical interaction that could promote the transmission of the virus. We are actively promoting social distancing and follow the recommendation of various health authorities around hand washing and sanitizing. <clears throat> in today's market, this is really even more critical. If you look at the landscape of the food industry, it's constantly changing day by day, hour by hour. It's a dynamic place where trends can shift, customer ex expectations can really change in an instant from recalls to regulation, um, navigating that landscape can be a real challenge for organizations of all scopes and sizes, but by partnering with a trusted accredited certification body, um, such as FSI, or there's uh, a lot of other good um, associations out there as well that can help. So we really define our services into four key areas, uh, auditing and certification to accredited third party international standards, such as GFSI or ISO, second party auditing, uh, we do customer specific and supply chain as well as training solutions for our clients. So looking specifically at the FSI side of the house, here's a sample of some of the programs that we offer today. There are many types of audits in the industry. Some are accredited, some are unaccredited, some are client specific, some are government regulated and some are even retailer mandated. As previously mentioned, uh, we work in almost every sector across the food supply chain, and we categorize our offerings into really five main channels. So first is our first party audits. These are customer specific where the client or a corporate entity owns the audit standard. And for various reasons, such as technical knowledge, location of our auditors, uh, language requirements, minimizing costs to your business, these are all typical reasons that our clients contract us to perform these types of audits. Uh, or assessments and inspections. Um, they're typically one to two days in length and either the site or the corporate office pays the cost of these assessments, generally at the direction of the corporation. First party audits can also be seen as an extension of your internal audit program as the certification body in this case is representing the corporation to manage your global supply chain risk. Our second party audit standards are similar in many ways to first party assessment, uh, assessments, excuse me. However, it is FSI who has developed and owned these schemes. So uh, these include standards like our GMP uh, for good manufacturing practice, GDP for distribution, HACCP, our cannabis and hemp standards. Usually it's the retailers who approve a certification body standards and then they list it or list this information either uh, uh, via a letter or on their website so that their suppliers know who they can use and who they've um, approved. I find that many clients like to use the second party assessments because they're developed by a reputable body such as FSI. Uh, they've been technically vetted and are essentially audit ready. Keep in mind that if using a second party audit standard with FSI, um, you actually have the ability to fully customize that as well and either add or remove areas of the standard that aren't applicable for your business, in which case, that then would become your first party audit. Um, so an audit duration for second party, again, depends on the size of the facility, but typically one to two days is the norm. The site receiving the audit generally pays for the audit and owns the report, at which time the report can then be shared with uh, the site's other customers. And our third party audit programs are all of the standards that we uh, audit to that are accredited 
under ISO 17065 or ISO 17021, which are the standards that essentially govern the certification bodies. Uh, so standards here would be uh, SQF, BRC, you know, ISO 9001, 14001, FSSC, Global Gap, and also the GRMA set of standards uh, or the 455 group now. So finally, FSI is recognized as an accredited body uh, to perform various audits and inspections uh, such as uh, FISMA or the FSMA, FSVP for Foreign Supplier Verification Program, and the Voluntary Qualified Importer Program or VQIP. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, PJR was originally founded in 1994, uh, today the largest registrar in the Americas. A sample here, uh, sorry, um, Amy, just go back one slide if you don't mind. Um, a sample on the screen here shows the uh, really incredible depth of the core management system standards that really started it all. Um, we conduct accredited audits across many schemes, including quality, uh, aerospace, automotive, environmental, and many others. Uh, for your own business uh, needs or that of your supply chain. Now, when you think about it, food safety management system certification, although over 10 years old, is really still in its infancy compared to uh, many of the well-known standards found here. Many years ago, uh, we saw a dramatic shift from individual system audits to combined audits and then moving to integrated audits where a company would have one integrated management system or an IMS that would cover multiple areas of their business, such as an integrated uh, QHNS program. That's really standard practice today on the management system side, not so much on the food side. Over the last several years, I've seen a lot of combination of audits, but from an integrated perspective with other management systems uh, in food safety, we're not quite there yet, but we, we will get there eventually. So we have a long uh, standing relationship uh, and we're recognized around the world with many accreditation bodies or ABs and uh, various scheme owners such as SQF and BRC. Um, accreditation gives customers the assurance that FSI operates under the rules of an accreditation body and the scheme owners which regulate and help maintain the highest quality of our work. On many occasions um, and many are coming up this month we partner with these groups to ensure that we receive the most up-to-date uh, information that we can and then pass that along to you, our customers, such as what we're doing here today and all month actually. Um, where typically we as a certification body come and audit you, the accreditation bodies and scheme owners come and audit us. It's a very large investment that's made every year by uh, certification bodies and by our family of companies, but it's well worth it because it gives our customers confidence around the world that they've partnered with a recognized and respected certification body. Uh, on top of all the respected ABs and scheme owners that are shown here, I just want to bring special attention to the GRMA or the Global Retailer and Manufacturer Alliance. If you haven't heard of it, you probably will uh, in the near future. I'm proud to announce that we've become a partner certification body uh, to the GRMA set of standards and look forward to supporting any of your needs that you might have down the road for that. So now I want to move on to our uh, auditor um, calibration onboarding process, because this is very important. I really believe this is one of the value adds um, that we have as an organization. Just to give you a short overview, um, to start, it's the policy of FSI to recruit auditors and inspectors with the highest possible caliber, uh, meeting the necessary scheme requirements in terms of qualifications and experience. Our audit and uh, inspection teams are really highly recognized by our clients for their professionalism, their quality of work, their impartiality, their industry knowledge, and they generally have between 12 to 15 years of experience. Now, I believe this adds integrity to your process, credibility in our findings, and consistency really in the overall approach. Um, the onboarding process is quite rigorous at FSI, generally lasting three to six months, depending on the qualification and background of our assessors. It starts with initial interviews, background checks, references, from there, every auditor needs to complete a series of mandatory online training courses and videos that have been developed internally. This is then followed up with a competency exam specific to the standards they're looking to be qualified uh, to audit against. Once this stage has been successfully completed, our auditors then participate in observation, supervision, and uh, qualified lead shadow audits. This process is required for uh, any new standards an auditor is looking to become qualified for and our full-time and contract auditors follow the process. 
I believe this is one of the value added requirements that we have to offer our clients. By ensuring our auditors are fully vetted and qualified based on the process, we add great value to the customer and the audit schemes for which they uh, audit. So in terms of continuous education, uh, for client-specific audit programs, we have regular monthly meetings to discuss audit process, feedback from the auditor, the site, the scheme owners, and to further discuss best practices as a group. And then finally, once per year, we host an in-person auditor training where our auditors all attend uh, to ensure they're fully up to date with the industry as a whole and the specific standards that they're auditing to. So we also offer full on-site training programs for our customers. Um, these are delivered on behalf of FSI. We use our subject matter experts in the industry. Um, so whether your needs are site specific or across your global operations, we can design and facilitate a customized uh, blended learning program for your location or that of your suppliers. Uh, we can work with your company to uh, understand your needs, design a general curriculum, um, and that would really be designed uh, to foster development of critical skills like um, you know, thinking, writing, speaking, but also offering students the opportunity to expand on the current requirements around food safety, sanitation, and hygiene. So um, another key area, uh, and I believe truly a value add for FSI, is how we manage and onboard our clients. This is important. Um, I've, I've seen it far too many times in the past where a company comes on board and you never hear from them again. Our focus is value added food safety certification. And that means that every member of our team from our president, Terry Baboyge and the leadership to our auditors has the complete customer satisfaction in mind every step of the way. Now, if you remember, I mentioned to you earlier about customer service versus customer focus. Um, and you know from Amy that I was a professional chef for over 20 years. During that time, I worked with every employee that reported to me, and I worked to instill a customer focused mindset as opposed to customer service. So customer service, what does that mean? I, I think good customer service typically means providing timely, attentive, even upbeat service to our customers, making sure your needs are met in a manner that really reflects positively on your business. We certainly aim to do this. However, at FSI, we also want to focus on you as a client. So what does that mean? In my opinion, the real difference between service and focus is that with focus, we're trying to put ourselves in our customer situations and view things from your perspective. This is important because it helps us better understand our customers, what their needs are, and to find the right solution for you, not one that we want you to have. So I just want to mention that's quite important. So just to speak a little further about focus, um, I believe it's important that we have a process to work with our clients and onboard them to uh, FSI. So this starts with a general phone call, uh, introduction meeting, face-to-face -face meeting to meet you, understand your business, uh, find out what your needs and requirements are, whether those are internally or externally mandated, and to understand how our services could ultimately uh, help with your business meet its needs. So once we fully understand your requirements and you've confirmed you'd like to partner with FSIA, then at that point, we assign a, a dedicated project services team to you that's made up of several members of the team who really are all working towards the same goal, uh, your goal, in fact. I'll, I'll go a little deeper into that in a minute, but after your team's been assigned, uh, we would prepare your proposal or master services agreement or service level agreement based on your needs. Uh, once that's complete, it's, it's definitely not over at that point. That's really where we just start getting started. Uh, we want our partnership with you to be mutually beneficial and focused on continuous improvement and transparency of the information while mitigating your risk and helping to protect your brand. So this next slide just uh, is really kind of a quick introduction of our food safety and supply chain team here in the Americas. I'm not gonna go through each person, but I wanna let you know we're all committed to working in close partnership with our clients through the deployment of dedicated team to manage all of the interactions, uh, whether that be commercial, technical, or operational. Uh, we'll provide uh, first class technical support, reporting, customer service, teamwork, commitment, as well as help you to drive continuous improvement within your operations. Your team also provides you with the day-to-day -day support and are responsible for ensuring full um, operational delivery and aligning the defined scope of work to make sure your needs are being met. So to touch a little bit more on our project services team, this is a typical example of how a project services team could be structured. It really depends a lot on the size and complexity of your business. 
For example, for a small and medium-sized organization, a SAM or a strategic account manager would not be assigned. The SAMs would be our technical experts on the file who are put in place for the very large clients or clients who have a, a complex business or supply chain. Uh, a SAM's responsibility is really to fully immerse themselves in your business and be the technical expert on the file for the standards that are being implemented. Uh, your executive contact is always a VP or above. Uh, their main priority is to ensure that, the re that we have the resources and infrastructure in place to deliver on our promise of uh, operational delivery for you. Um, the executive contact would also have full authority over the contract and negotiate global pricing on your behalf if that's required. They're also your direct line into the executive management for any escalation or issues uh, that you might have. Your business manager is your direct contact for all things commercial. So they prepare your agreements. Uh, they make sure we fully understand your expectations and KPIs. They make sure that they work with our internal team to onboard you as a client so that everybody internally at FSI understands who you are and what your needs are. You'll also be assigned a scheduler. Uh, they're responsible for the scheduling uh, invoice certificate requests. And by really having a team, uh, you know, a full team here working for you, uh, I feel and I know we feel that this adds significant value. So moving on to project management, um, we recognize that your business operates within a large uh, and fast paced environment. It's subject to change at very short notice, especially uh, in today's environment. Um, as part of our project management approach, at a minimum once per year, your business manager um, or your SAM, if applicable, will meet with you to discuss your site's performance, how you compare to industry, look at upcoming schedules or amendments that you may have, any feedback that's received from the sites and the audit teams, discuss new initiatives that are happening in the industry uh, that could affect your business. This is really a critical process, uh, one, to ensure that we stay connected with our clients, but I believe it's something that most companies are not delivering on today. Uh, we're different, we want to ensure that, as I said before, our partnership is beneficial and mutual to both parties. To talk a little bit about your supply chain, um, I've heard many times over the years that uh, suppliers pose the most significant risk to your business for many reasons. Uh, supply chains are complex webs uh, and the need to manage those risks have never been greater, especially today. Our goal is to minimize and mitigate risk within your uh, business and organization, as well as assist in protecting your brand through effective and consistent audit protocol with your suppliers. Um, a supply chain is, as we know, only strong, uh, as strong as its weakest link. And in the industry of food processing and production, failure anywhere along that chain can trigger a huge range of consequences for you. That could include uh, product recalls, uh, which cost the companies millions in some cases, and even consumer deaths, which uh, absolutely damages your brand. A vital way of preventing this type of situation is the regular use of uh, FSI supplier audits using industry best practice, regulatory requirements, and the experience of our team to review everything from uh, pest control to sanitation, foreign material control, swabbing, and even environmental monitoring and record keeping. When I begin discussing a supplier program with our clients, we talk about many areas of their business. It's not just food safety. It's anything that can be affected by the supply chain. It's quite important, I believe, to look at the full view of your supply chain and the unique risks that uh, present themselves. So we can perform assessments of your suppliers using really any combination of our first, second, or third party audits and tailor a specific audit program for any client offering a fully customized experience to gather the most comprehensive and accurate data possible. Uh, of course, food safety and quality are important, um, especially with the people that are on this call. But what about your supplier's understanding of what your company's management approach is and philosophy is? Do they understand what your vision is and how uh, they play a part in that. What improvements and controls do your suppliers have in place to support that philosophy? How about uh, delivery aspects? Are your suppliers able to handle the sheer capacity of your needs, and especially in today's market? Have they planned uh, the appropriate raw materials to manage your needs? What about the financial stability of their company? Are they at risk of acquisition or bankruptcy? How reliant are they on your business, for example? Are they single source? Are they a sole supplier? Do your vendors understand what your policies are around brand expectation uh, of your company? And what processes do they have in place to protect your brand? 
So going back to the combined audit versus integrated audit scenario, this is where we can fully integrate your supplier audits to maximize the efficiency of your program and demonstrate economies for your organization and that of your suppliers. I guess an example would be integrating a food safety uh, brand audit and social accountability audit into one new audit program uh, for you. That's where we can support you uh, in many scenarios. So just to wrap up my portion, and I um, truly thank everyone for listening to me, um, you know, really with 30 years of auditing experience, um, you know, we're recognized uh, by the IAR as the number one registrar in the Americas. I know that FSI will um, bring a service that adds significant value and will create an opportunity to provide greater transparency, cost effectiveness, improve risk management, and enhance your brand and your protection of the brand. And on a daily basis, we're publishing content and information that you can use to protect your company. We work closely with all of our clients uh, to meet your needs and expectations and demands that's placed on you by industry. And as I mentioned before, there is a real difference between service and customer focus, and everyone here would love the opportunity to uh, uh, talk to you and prove that to you. So is your certification going above and beyond uh, your expectations in today's market? That's the important question. So at this point, um, I am done. I would just like to say in closing to, um, and, and to uh, further keep you informed, here's a list of some of the upcoming webinars that we have uh, planned for April. Um, we're gonna be very busy. We'd love to have you join us for these as well. And as you can see, we're working uh, directly and closely with many of the scheme owners and uh, subject matter expert organizations and associations to deliver the most relevant information for you. So at this point, I again, thank you so much for your time. Stay safe and I'll pass it back to you, Amy. Thanks, Paul. Uh, that was a great overview of everything PJRFSI PGR, is all about. Uh, so now before we move along to introduce our guest speakers today, we have another polling question we'd like to send your way, which is, What do you need most from us at this time to support your business? And the possible answers would be information on resources to respond to COVID-19 in food production, information about FSI certification options to help protect market access, support continuing certification edu and, and education, excuse me, through travel restrictions and other delays, or all of the above. All right, and it looks like we've got about 40% responding, so I'll give it another couple of seconds. And thank you to everybody who's giving their input. We really do appreciate it. All right, we've got about 50% responding, so I'll go ahead and close the poll. And it looks like most people are interested in resources responding to COVID-19 specifically, and that really shouldn't be that surprising. It's on everybody's mind right now. Um, and everyone who wants all the options, of course, we love to provide everything we can to help you. If you have any special requests or suggestions of things you'd like to see in the future, we do absolutely welcome suggestions via email. You can reach us at pgrfsi at pgrfsi.com. But let's go ahead and close the poll. And now, I would like to introduce our two guest speakers for today, uh, Garanka and Raiko Platisa from PCR Corporation, who will be discussing best practices in crisis management during this global pandemic. Garanka is an authorized contract trainer and consultant for BRC, SQF, and FSSC 22000. She's also an FSPC lead instructor for human food and NFSTP certified trainer. Garanka specializes in food safety QMS development and GFSI certificate preparation training program development and delivery. And Ryko is a ISO 14001 EMS lead auditor, BRC, SQF, and FSSC 22000 trainer and consultant, as well as an FSPC lead instructor for human food and an FSTP certified trainer. Ryko specializes in the implementation and maintenance of SQF, BRC, FSSC 22000 and HACCP systems. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to Raiko and Garanka and take it away. Hello. 
Hello, everyone. First of all, we want to thank uh, you, Amy and Paul, for introducing us and having us um, be part of your team at Perry Johnson uh, and giving us opportunity to present our perspectives on current situation with COVID-19, which we all are in, and the impacts on our lives, primarily at work. Uh, what COVID-19 did not change is the fact that we continue to be a food and beverage supply chain member, farmer, supplier, producer, distributor, retailer, customer, or consumer. Um, above all, we all still we still need to maintain our food safety systems at the highest level possible and be audit ready at all times. Um, we can move to the next uh, slide. Okay, um, so uh, while we don't have uh, 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 we don't have uh, reports of foodborne illnesses that are related to transmission of COVID-19, because we talk about virus here, uh, we do recommend uh, taking uh, extra precautions for unpackaged exposed goods, which may have been handled or affected by an employee or customer who has been infected by the virus or the product has been assembled and packed in the area or using packaging material that may have been potentially exposed to a virus. Of course, that, that is part of what every plan now should involve. Um, as far as uh, FDA, uh, uh, in the next slide, um, it, as far as what FDA is, is doing, we all know their involvement and primarily at this small point, I guess, in medical implications of uh, COVID-19. Um, on the other side, as far as uh, supply chain goes, uh, medical supply chain, and that in, in food industry has a lot of common things um, as uh, in both cases, we have to focus on a food chain, supply chain integrity and availability. Uh, definitely fo main focus is on diagnosing, treating and preventing disease. Uh, of course, uh, more information and up-to-date information, which is very important, um, may be found on the coronavirus information page uh, for FDA. I uh, just want to mention that all uh, the links to the main important resources currently is on the last uh, one of the last slides towards the bottom of this slideshow, uh, which is the page that everybody will also have access to. Um, I would like to move to uh, uh, now reflect on what CFIA on the other side, so Canadian Food Inspection Agency, is doing. Um, aside from uh, closely focusing on challenges and concerns, um, raised by industry uh, and consumers regarding COVID-19, uh, definitely uh, there is a strong focus, a much higher level of uh, focus than, than usually on any uh, food safety investigations and recalls, uh, animal disease investigations, inspection services, export certification, um, emergency management, and so on. Um, I would now like to say a few words about GFSI focused uh, in the next slide, um, which is um, mainly the main focus, as we all know, and this, this is where many eyes are uh, looking at, is on, uh, and the focus of GFSI is definitely on uh, CPOs or certification program owners, as well as CVs or certification bodies, and their ability to follow the requirements mandated by GFSI and on the other side, applicable national regulations in managing COVID-19 outbreak. Um, unnecessary to talk about the uh, um, importance of those issues. Um, there are some rec uh, recommendations, some very practical recommendations, such as recommendations for CBs to uh, possibility of using auditors from other regions that are not affected by and have no restrictions to other sites in relation to COVID-19 outbreak, to much more detailed and much more technical aspects, which obviously I would um, I'll let you explore on your own uh, by visiting my GFSI website, because um, I, at this point, as we know, situation is developing uh, daily, and whatever I will say may already have been updated to this point. But definitely main focus is on process of certifications, 
um, and for uh, CVs and certificated, certificated sites uh, to look at possibilities of extension of certificates and, and some other options which are definitely described in their updates. Um, I would uh, move, if we can move to another slide. Thank you. Um, now looking at what other companies are doing, we definitely start with uh, uh, focusing on um, on um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, focusing on centers for disease control and their recommendations. Uh, we definitely look at random recommendations coming from our regulatory bodies, um, as always, and. Um, um, there is very different uh, aspects. There's various aspects that our focus is on or other companies are focused on. Um, and despite the fact that, as we know, uh, every uh, global food safety standards system or implemented system in, in companies does require program to uh, preparedness on emergency planning and business continuity, still some companies may have been um, uh, found uh, not ready to uh, 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 deal with the situation and uh, or are finding challenges in handling it. That's why in the later slides we'll be talking more about the uh, business continuity plan and some key steps that is always uh, good to, to look at. But definitely um, our focus here is on uh, impact of, of the uh, COVID-19 on the supply chain and finding alternative sources and minimizing disruptions and shortages, shortages in supplies as much as possible. Uh, the next slide, please, thank you. Uh, uh, we'll be talking about recommending recommended steps on, um, um, uh, and we will start with um, developing uh, a plan um, developing a plan of um, action, basically, based on situation, based on specifics of the sites, based on um, what the company does and how. Um, and, and the key steps, as we most of you know, is starting with identifying risks, um, um, working closely with colleagues to, to, to assess and, and identify any possible risks that are um, uh, um, that are reasonable to expect, and then work collaboratively on, on identifying and finding uh, appropriate, the most appropriate responses to each of the risks that may have been identified. Uh, the plan should continue with de developing responses, um, and uh, uh, our responses need to be effective and efficient um, be able uh, ability to uh, take them and uh, and, and uh, uh, act upon quickly and effectively is definitely one of the key um, uh, priorities here. Um, we talk about implementing triggers, so uh, levels at which the responses will be pulled and put in place, and so on. Um, this is. Um, in the continuation of uh, uh, developing our plan on the next slide, we talk about very important uh, aspect of uh, any uh, handling any situation in the plant, which is definitely in communication. Um, so the companies are expected to develop effective methods of communication, very importantly, keeping uh, control of the flow of communication and information that is shared or communicated between the team members or management and the team members in the company, with avoiding any situations such as panic and so on, which may only be detrimental to the process. Definitely providing um, regular updates uh, on situation and uh, uh, um, generally outside the plant, but also very specifically inside the plant is is what what we have to be focused on uh, in the next uh, on the next slide uh, talking about preventing the uh, spread of illness which definitely is very important aspect um, emphasizes definitely staying home and sick and but those who are working obviously uh, changes perspectives on how that work is completed and what are the measures on top of existing uh, GMPs that we follow what are the additional measures that we have to put in place 
uh, anything from uh, operating in a production room over to hand handling meetings and uh, quick uh, information exchanges between the team members, emphasizing use of uh, non-direct contact whenever possible, keeping the distances and so on, um, is just definitely just some of the uh, aspects that are uh, to be in, in that part of the plan. Um, are, we know that uh, viruses are a little bit different in, in terms of, there are some specifics of viruses versus uh, bacteria, and we had to be fully aware of that. And that part was not, not so much um, present in, in our hazard analysis in the past, so obviously does require much more a uh, much more detailed look at this point of time. Um, um, also, um, many aspects of that uh, uh, operation or how uh, practices in, in the workplace are now specific. Uh, on top of hand washing and so on, we definitely talk about many other things um, um, and, and many, many different functions in the plant will go through some challenges and had to find suitable solutions in order to be safe and stay safe. Anything from receiving materials, from handling materials throughout the plant, over to communicating to your team members, uh, another process operator next to you, and so on. Um, this is just some of the aspects that I wanted to bring into this part. Um, on the next slide, okay. Um, uh, we, we definitely had to look at um, implications of travel, as we all know, uh, not only with uh, regular travel, but any travel, any, any visitors who may have tra traveled and uh, are potentially coming to the plant, are going again, avoiding any face-to-face uh, -face contacts, if ever possible, conducting meetings online, uh, virtually, as we say, um, and then um, uh, looking at any other measures, uh, following the webs, uh, following it, it recommendations of CDC centers on travel, uh, travel recommendations and so on is definitely always very uh, important. And uh, uh, very importantly, uh, uh, keeping track and keeping up to date with any um, um, uh, updates from uh, local over to states or federal um, regulatory bodies or um, agencies in this particular situation is of utmost importance. Um, um, so uh, definitely local conditions are very important uh, and they sh sh shall have definitely very much impact, a lot, a fair, fair bit of impact on how we handle things on the site. Uh, so uh, we have to be completely up to date and have communication, not only be up to date with the information they provide, but also um, be in touch and have lines of communication open with any of those agencies in order to be able to get any clarifications or further instructions in the case if needed uh, on time. Uh, supply chain management in the, next, in the following slide. Um, Supply chain management uh, is definitely one of the most important things. And now different perspectives that open up with respect to uh, ordering or identifying what essential supplies are, planning production, but then practical processes of receiving, uh, or inspecting trucks and receiving loads and storage of uh, materials, inspecting materials and everything else. Um, pretty much every step of that process have to be re, uh, have, we have to rethink every pretty much step of that process in order to make sure that we adequately respond to this new challenge, which is uh, current and and present. Um, um, as 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 we are all uh, aware, we have to identify essential uh, processes, essential employees, essential uh, materials, um, essential products. And, and pretty much review and rethink pretty much any step in the process from receiving over to finished product. Uh, of course, uh, with, with a lot of emphasis on packaging, packaging materials, uh, surfaces during the packaging, 
uh, or assembling and packaging stages and, and so on. Um, uh, now, I guess we are coming to polling question. <laughs> Thank you for that, Raiko. Yes, we do have another polling question for our audience. And this next question is, what would your company need to mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic? And possible responses are a complete risk assessment and implementation of control measures, uh, development and implementation of an upgraded BCP or business continuity plan, uh, review and modifying uh, applicable sections of the QMS, or all of the above. I'll just leave this open for another couple of seconds. All right, it looks like we've got about 50%, so I'm going to go ahead and close the polling. And it does look like most people think they should work on all possible, all three possible answers. Um, however, a complete risk assessment and implementation of control measures does seem to be the most popular choice. So go ahead and close the poll out. And I will hand it right back to you, Reiko. Uh, now, now it's my turn, it's Varanka. And since Reiko talked about the impact COVID-19 on the food industry, uh, I would like to talk more about action plan and about business continuity plan that uh, most of you guys should have in place if you are GFSI certified. Even without that, most of the companies uh, in the food industry, they have business continuity plan. This is uh, something that I would like to talk to you. It's about the business continuity. On the next slide, we're talking of uh, what we have to do actually continue our business and uh, as we are experiencing uh, there is a lot of challenges not only in the professional life also in our personal life how to cope with all these changes how to make this happen and what else I can what what else I have to do what extra I have to do which extra mile I have to go with uh, businesses of all size can develop and uh, make the business continuity plan. Uh, since we know that we have existing one, it's a good time for us to now reassess and see where's our gaps. Why we don't have, for example, pandemic uh, illnesses uh, trial on the business continuity plan once a year that is part of our GFSI standard recommendation is it either for the BRC or SQF or FSCC or any other one. Uh, we definitely, definitely have to plan how for the impact of pandemic on our business, how this is impact our business if we don't have any plans. If you don't have any plans, we should develop uh, for impact of pandemic on your employees and your customers, how this is going to affect on your employees, how you're going to manage and overcome with challenges if somebody is not showing at work, who should be replacement, do we have backup person, customers, relationship needs to be now, all of you should be engaged with the customers and definitely everybody should assign the person responsible for these kind of actions. We have to establish policy, uh, one that they're not existing in regards to this uh, pandemic situation. We also have to allocate resources to protect your employees, your customers, your suppliers uh, during this pandemic. Communication is one of the keys in this one. You have to communicate and educate your employees. That's one of the key and essential uh, components of this uh, whole continuous uh, a business continuity plan. People are in panic. How to make sure that we're all can calm, that we all know what should be done and that we always can expect something different in not even 24 hours. In four hours, some plan is gonna change. So we need to make sure that we have somebody who's gonna lead all senior management leaders should really be trained and get this effectively done. 
We also recommend that the business continuity plan uh, coordinate with external organizations. Uh, as Raiko mentioned, uh, we should be all the time on the website, like on the daily basis, what FDA recommends, what uh, CFIA, what our scheme owners are talking about that. Uh, we can see that um, Perry Johnson actually offers some uh, webinars for the BRC, SPF and other scheme owners. So uh, go and inform yourself and coordinate with that to be informed. Definitely, we have to be adaptive during uh, this pandemic situation. Uh, in the complex and uncertain environment uh, involving this crisis, the most robust organization will not be those uh, that simply have plan in place. It will be the one that have continuous sensing and response capability that you have supplies on time, that you communicate with people, that you are uh, training your people, you verifying what's happening on the floor all the time, that you following all the all these internal rules that you have to follow. Uh, how are we going to evaluate these changes? Make your plans. See what was in the old, move forward and make the new plan, new way how you're going to manage this business. Develop the team and strategy that will allow you, you know, quick and very effective evaluation. So you have to evaluate. All of you are familiar with the root cause analysis. Use this tool to identify what is the pro problem, how I end up, how I overcome with this problem. So use this tool that will be very effective in this continuous business plan. Uh, communicate, uh, try to communicate on global level with everybody. See if you have lots of supplies for the affected uh, countries. See what's going on over there. Learn from their uh, problems and uh, make sure that this is not going to happen to you. Work proactively that we learned for so many years in this even HACCP or GFS side. We always said that this quality management system are proactive systems. So we have to uh, overcome with this situation. Even if we have this kind of crisis, we have to make the plan, continuous plan that we have to make the products because without food, we can be alive. So we really need desperately uh, make the information available, make the plan, train our people. And one of the topics that uh, it's on this slide is leadership and company culture. For those that they don't have company culture, senior management needs to be involved and have a specific roles and specifically for this COVID-19. We need to make sure that when you're developing a culture and mechanism that support, you have to be very adaptable. You have to communicate with the your customers, even with your uh, uh, companies that uh, are your competitors. Make sure that you in this uh, uh, situation in which globally we are experiencing, it's a very sad situation and very complex, very uncertain, that we going to make sure that the food business is gonna continue. On the end of all of this, I would like to make the conclusion and say that uh, as far as we know, likely COVID will continue in the coming days, maybe in coming months. We don't know. We always see the even signs on the stores, retail stores or pharmacy offices or wherever it is, post office. It says until further notification. So we have to live our life with that. So. Uh, this situation will likely be not different and we have to make sure that uh, we have a contingency plan and strategic plan how to make better and how we what we have to do on the end to make sure that our customers will be provided with the safe food so concentrate on your quality management system program. Make sure that you're going to do risk assessment in 
any of these pointing area such as GMPs, supplier approval programs, HACCP, HACCP risk assessments, make sure that you're going to enhance your existing continuously, continuously business plan or crisis management plan. Make sure that you communicate on all levels, externally and internally, on the daily basis. Make sure, uh, uh, for sure, one step number one is to establish a good team with good communicational skills, which one can effectively work on the corrective options immediately. Uh, this is something that uh, I would like to thank you, everyone. Uh, and looking forward for your feedback. And uh, on the slide, next slide, we put uh, the resources that you can use uh, and uh, get being informed on lots of situations more in depth and educate yourself and your team. Make sure that you're sharing and delegating uh, stuff and work to others because sometimes it might happen that you have to end up be on the floor and help your packaging people get products out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Garanka and Raiko, for your awesome input. I'm going to leave this resources slide up for just another moment, and then we have one final polling question for everyone to respond to. And that last question pertains to um, what webinar topics everyone would like to see from us in the future. So I'll go ahead and pull up that question. And just a general sampling of topics that we've had in the past that we would certainly be happy to revisit um, include FSVP, Foreign Supplier Verification Program, uh, FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, um, food safety culture in general, um, internal audits, or even sanitation preventative controls. And you can choose as many of these as you'd like. So if you want to hear about all of it, go ahead and choose all of them. If not, choose what interests you the most. And immediately after this poll is complete, we are going to open the floor for Q&A. So if you have any questions that occurred to you during the presentation, um, you can go ahead and type your question into the question or question and answer tab at the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel. And we'll be, be very happy to uh, review and answer any questions, uh, either regarding Paul's segment of the presentation or uh, Raiko and Garanka's portion. And our number one question that we typically get in webinar presentations is, will this webinar be available for review after the presentation has ended? In general, yes, we do record every webinar and it should be made available on our YouTube channel within about 24 to 48 hours after the completion of the webinar. It uh, really just depends on how long the webinar is and how long it takes to upload to YouTube. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, we do recommend it. We publish informational videos. Uh, like I said, all of our webinars are published on our YouTube channel, and you can either go to youtube.com and just search for Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety Incorporated, or you can go to the YouTube icon at the top of our homepage on pjrfsi.com. Um, if you click the YouTube icon up near the Facebook icon, it will take you directly to our channel on YouTube. And it looks like we've got about 60% reporting, so I'm going to close the poll. It looks like people want to hear about pretty much everything. So like Paul said at the beginning, we have lots of webinars in store for you. Believe me, I think we have, uh, what is it, Paul, five or six planned in the next two or three weeks? <laughs> yeah, correct, yes. All right, so let's go ahead and open up the Q&A. And it looks like we already have one question from Jackie. And I'm only going to use first names because last names I am infamous for butchering any name that is not very basic. And I apologize in advance if I do still mess up your name. Um, and Jackie wanted to know about uh, what certifications are available in China, specifically any that are GFSI. Right. Okay. Can you hear me okay, Amy? Yep, we can hear you. 
Yeah, we, we have, um, you know, several uh, all across the world. Uh, we offer certification to various standards. I know that uh, with the China market, it's certainly a, a little different in terms of the CNCA requirements uh, and whatnot. But if we have a need for a client to have uh, any GFSI audit, whether that be BRC or SQF uh, or FSCC or IFS, uh, depending on the need and if we don't have it we will look to uh, be able to offer that for you so what i would recommend there is maybe to send me a direct uh, message after the webinar and i can call and speak to you directly on that but typically speaking the standards that we have here in the americas are what we look to be able to deliver globally for our clients great thanks paul um, we do also have a question now from Cheryl, and Cheryl is asking, um, do you foresee the on-site audits being discontinued and virtual audits taking their place with technology such as Google Glasses? That is a great question. Uh, we are having daily conversations uh, about that with, and, and even hourly in some cases, not only internally uh, with our executive leadership, but also around the world with the various scheme owners. So. Um, where I can tell you that on the PJR side, most of the industry has gone to virtual audits and is accepting that. Uh, GFSI and the scheme owners have some uh, different expectations and requirements around that. At this point, um, you know, we're working with all of the scheme owners and you'll hear directly from them uh, starting next week, um, but they allow virtual auditing to a point. So if we're doing a stage one or a pre-assessment audit, we can do that virtually. If we are doing a stage two audit, there are some um, um, restrictions that we have. Um, you can go directly to uh, our website and find further information on that. Um, but we are currently looking to um, you know, conduct virtual audits with our clients as the scheme owners allow us to. In many cases, they're not allowing for virtual audits for food programs. Um, and that is not necessarily um, a requirement from the scheme owner like SQF or BRC because they you know these groups have different policies um, however when they take a look at the pandemic rules uh, under GFSI in the scheme document you'll see that uh, virtual audits is not um, uh, typically accepted for GFSI so we're currently working with them to get the most up-to-date information um, but what I can tell you is that we're fully set up we don't use Google Glasses but we have a different program that we use um, and if we can do a virtual audit with you, we absolutely will. Um, I believe, Amy, we have another uh, webinar tomorrow on uh, our virtual audit program and, and how we're doing that. I know for the last two we did on the virtual audit, we had about 400 people on the call. Yes, they were all we, very um, interested <laughs> in that. We do have yeah, another so. session uh, through PJR uh, has a, a scheduled webinar tomorrow. I believe it's at a 11 a.m. Um, Eastern Standard, um, and that's with uh, Joe Krolikowski, who's the QMS program manager, um, and he has a, it's a very, very good comprehensive overview of, you know, PJR's expectations, and obviously it extends to FSI as well. Um, the only difference is, as Paul was saying, you know, what's allowed by different bodies. That was a great question though. Um, any other questions, please go ahead and type them right into the questions tab. We would love to answer some more um, and we'll stick around for a little while longer. I know we've run past the 3 p.m. projected end time, but that's not a problem. We've got all the time in the world. Um, let's see, I've got a, I've got a question from John for Garanka. Um, Garanka, John asked, what is your expectation around training virtually? Is there a move towards that at present? I'm actually conducted during this uh, pandemic situation uh, three and scheduled for another five or four virtual trainings already. Oh, wow. And uh, I'm also doing, uh, we are as a group, as a PCR, we are uh, planning and continuously working uh, very hard on this. I can tell you this is very challenging type of the training. You need to know how to engage all your people. There's a way for that, definitely, to make sure that they're all engaged during the training. But so far, 
uh, good feedbacks uh, on our uh, feedback questionnaires and there's always opportunity for improvement but uh, uh, it, it's a good tool and uh, I'm encouraging people to start doing this type of the trainings because uh, from the plan perspective it's cost saving and uh, from our perspective as the trainers uh, engage people through this uh, new types of the portals you know it's a little bit challenging but it's good it's good to have this face-to-face -face, uh, with the webinar hug. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, and a follow-up to that, um, how often should uh, business continuity plans be reviewed? And um, is there any idea on getting further buy-in from senior executives uh, as far as implementing pandemic plans? Mm. Go ahead, if, if I may, <clears throat> I would like to answer this question. Well, as we know, as per the GFSI standards or most of standards, we have to do tests annually. However, the more the more we challenge our BCP program or emergency planning, uh, the more uh, challenges we discover and possibly more weaknesses we discover. Um, also, one recommendation with challenging your BCP program is uh, be hard on you. Um, don't go for simple and easy uh, situations go for for very complex situations and uh, assume things such as um, outbreaks of, of this kind of nature which was not so often used uh, and some other even more uh, challenging uh, questions whenever you're expecting uh, having people not coming to work whenever you're expecting shortage of supplies whenever you're expecting possibility of cross-contamination and so on it's always good to uh, have that uh, in place. I hope this answers that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Reiko. We yeah. do have a question from Robert regarding the uh, virtual audit webinar tomorrow. Um, if you'd like to register for that, Robert, or anyone else on the call who's interested, uh, if you just go to pjr.com, there is a training drop down, which also leads to a upcoming webinars page. Um, on that page, you'll find a list of upcoming webinars, and it should also include the virtual audit webinar that hap that's, that's happening tomorrow. Excuse me. Okay, and we have one final question. Um, this one's for Paul. Uh, would you update us on the various food safety conferences and what their plans are? And I know personally, just from what I've heard, a lot have been moved or canceled. Isn't that right, Paul? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Um, we've been seeing a lot of movement on that. Um, actually, uh, I, I'm quite impressed with the uh, United Fresh group. Instead of canceling their event in San Diego, they've moved to a, a completely virtual conference this year, uh, which is exciting. We started off the year uh, attending the GFSI conference in Seattle, um, and that was the last one. We had about three or four other ones that were planned uh, between now and then. Uh, they have all been, uh, two of them have been canceled, the BRC conference uh, in San Antonio, that was canceled and they're gonna redo that next year. Uh, there's a, a router supply chain uh, conference in Chicago that we haven't heard from. United Fresh has uh, moved to virtual. Um, several of the conferences under the executive platform uh, banner like the uh, manufacturing summit, the supply chain summit and the food safety uh, and quality summit, those have all moved to September, um, but right now there's been a lot of changes that are happening on that. But at the end of the day, um, although we like to get together and learn and see everyone, it, it's definitely in everyone's best interest. So if you want any further information on that, uh, again, send me a message. I'm happy to share our uh, complete list and updates with you. Yeah, and I know it's constantly changing. Uh, we did get one more question from Robert. Um, have the audit scheme holders aligned and put forth guidance on a plan for vendors that are needing to have their renewal audits during this time? Uh, uh, following that, uh, will there be an extension granted? Yes, so um, what they, and again, so the, the scheme owners, um, when, when this first started, Robert, it all started very, um, very much each scheme was doing their own plan. So SQF had a response plan, BRC did, so did FSSC. Um, and then uh, essentially what had happened is they all have decided to move towards what the requirements are under GFSI and what GFSI will allow. So right now, um, what they are allowing is a, a a six month um, extension of your audit uh, certificate. 
Now, to do that, though, what they are requiring us as a certification body to do is for every client that is looking to extend their certificate, uh, we can do that uh, with approval and with justification. But as a part of that, we also have to have a one to two hour risk assessment with you. Now, that is a, a, a mandated requirement that we have to follow and all CVs have to follow. Um, so if you are looking to do that, or if you want to um, even transfer to uh, FSI, or if you're a current client looking to do that, you can reach out to myself or Lauren Maloney, who's our program accreditation manager, and we would be very happy to uh, walk you through that individually. But as it sits today, that's the requirement. All right. If there's any other questions, please go ahead and drop them right into that question box. I'll leave the line open for another minute or two just to see if any um, last responses or questions trickle in. Um, otherwise, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, for attending. Um, I think this is, has been our best attended webinar, and at least at least as far as I know, and I've been here about three years. And I wanted to thank Paul as well as our guests uh, Raiko and Goranka for their time. I know everyone is insanely busy. I know I've been running off my feet, so I can only imagine how busy uh, Paul and Raiko and Garanka are. Um, and we've got some compliments coming in from Robert. Thank you for your questions, Robert. We always like to hear that everyone's engaged and interested in the topic. Um, so Paul, any parting words before we wrap up for the day? Just uh, stay safe out there. Um, I know we all hear it, but we're in it together. And as I said, our goal is, uh, you know, you're not going to hear me trying to uh, work with you and and sell you anything or build your business right now it's not about that it's about it's about us working with you to give you all the information that you need um, so that you can look at us as a true partner and thought leader in the industry um, i welcome any input uh, or direct uh, email contact and thank you very much everyone for joining Karanka and raiko again thank you so much it's been great you're welcome thank you very much it was thank our you. pleasure to work with you and your team all right. Thank you so much, guys. And like I said at the beginning, if anyone has any questions that they want to address to our speakers or to PGRFSI in general, um, please go ahead and email those to us. You can, you know, be directed to their email through um, PGRFSI at PGRFSI.com. And we are happy to take any questions there that weren't answered here. Or if you happen to think of something after you've left, we're happy to uh, help you out with whatever comes up. So I will go ahead and sign off for the day and we hope to see you on an upcoming webinar. Thank you all so much and have a great day.